FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is 228.18, last day of the month. And, well, what a month it's been, but we're, we're watching the trends here, and we'll be talking more about that later. As always, of course, email us to be part of the show, kl at kerrylutz.com. So interest rates are on the rise. Can the stock market withstand it? Can housing sales withstand it? Can the economy at large withstand higher interest rates, especially with deficits running at a trillion dollars per annum and higher? Well, Gerald Salenti, you run Trends Journal, and you're the one to ask. So welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on, Carrie. Always great being on with you. Uh, always great to have you too there, Gerald. And hey, if you want to find Gerald's site, trendsresearch.com, highly recommended. It's kind of like getting, almost like getting a peek at tomorrow's newspaper or perhaps next month's. So, hey, higher interest rates, they're kind of inevitable, especially with the deficits we're running, everything else. Can the Fed avoid seeing higher rates? Certainly on the short term, maybe they control it. Long term, 5% interest uh, on 30-year fixed mortgages it's just around the corner. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's taking its toll already. And um, you go back and look at what happened with uh, new home sales. They fell 7.8% in December when rates rose to 4.40% mortgage. And pending home sales dropped 4.7% in January, hitting the lowest point in four years. Mm -hmm. So go back four years ago, yeah, everything wasn't great, you know, and, and we're just starting to get into the recovery of, of the housing market. So what we're looking at, and you're seeing what happens every time you heard the new Fed Chair Powell come out at the House hearing on uh, Tuesday saying that they were a bit hawkish. That was his inclination without saying those words to raise rates more than Wall Street has anticipated. And bam, the market drops 299 points. So it's apparent that the United States and the world uh, cannot take higher interest rates. And that's really what's kept the whole Ponzi scheme going is the flood of cheap money and historically low interest rates. So what's going to happen? Well, we believe this is the end of the Trump rally. Uh, and there's going to be at least a 10% correction. And that's how already happened, but it went back up and possibly even a bear market if um, some geopolitical issues start to explode in the Middle East or other kind of a um, black swan event or, or a uh, wild card that could really drive the markets lower. And so, so it's not the time to be buying a house. I mean, look, Gerald, we had interest rates on 30 year fixed. They were at one point, uh, if you remember way back when, I mean, maybe even eight, nine years ago, they went down to 2.75% on a 30 year fixed mortgage. Now we're looking at rates. If it just goes back to its traditional five, five and a half, six percent, just say five to six percent, and the markets are bowing over at that point, what's going to happen if it hits six or seven? And what happens to U.S. debt? Well, the U.S. debt, and how about the global debt? Mm -hmm. You have a global debt of over $47 trillion. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the U.S. debt is with what? It's exceeding $20 trillion, and it's now the highest it's been in 70 years. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at in, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio. So what we're looking at is a world that cannot tolerate higher interest rates because it's very simple. The party is ending. Mm -hmm. More debt, rising interest rates, higher costs, 
great a burden. And then when you look at the United States, and let's go back to the beginning of February, uh, Kerry, when the market started to unravel, you know the reason they gave. Well, wages are going up and we're afraid about inflation. Remember that one? Sure. Well, hourly wages, according to the reports, went up nearly 3%. And that was the strongest increase since June of 2009. But when we looked behind the headlines, we saw the facts. And the facts were that the increase largely affected supervisory positions and that wages for non-supervisory jobs, which comprise 80% of the labor force, remained at a miserly 2.4% growth rate. Mm-hmm. So it's not filtering its way down to the real middle class, but the middle class did get a tax cut, which should add something to their bottom line. Ah, peanuts. Huh? Well, peanuts are better than crumbs, though, aren't they, Gerald? Yeah, not, not a lot better. <laughs> uh, not considering the tax breaks that the wealthy got. And again, you look at the tax policy institutes and centers, the nonpartisan groups, They, according to them, 80% of the tax breaks will benefit the 1% the most. Hmm. And the, and the tax breaks will be running out for we, the little people, in several years besides. And so this was just, again, the, I'm not, I'm just giving you the, what I've sure. read and what has been accepted as generally accepted as the truth from the analysis being done. So going back to the housing market, here's the other big phony lie that they're putting out. Uh, maybe not a lie, but a misconception. You keep hearing that, well, you know, the reason why the uh, housing market is slumping is there's not enough inventory out there, Mm. right? Yeah, I heard that a lot. Yeah. Well, currently, it it will take 6.1 months to clear the housing supply. Mm. The normal standard is six to seven months to clear inventory. So it's right at the average. It's not at the low end, but that's being ignored by the media. And what they're basically ignoring is why housing sales are going down. Is that going back to jobs? Wages stink for the average American. And we're talking about, again, with interest rates going up. So with disposable income increasing just under 2% and a rate rise to four or five percent for a thirty-year loan, it spikes monthly mortgage costs twelve percent for the average American that's being frozen out of the market. So that's what's really going on. You just don't have people with money to buy homes, and homes are too expensive. And then they say things like, "Well, there's a shortage of inventory for homes under a hundred thousand dollars." Now, where are you living? What are you kidding me? <laughs> Home for under hundred thousand dollars? You're talking a trailer? Yeah, yeah. In uh, in most areas in the country, hundred k is not going to buy you much. Although during the crash, hundred thousand could buy you a heck of a nice house in a lot of places in the country. But all the the prices seem to be at record levels again. And let's not forget when they say these housing starts, they don't really break out for public consumption, again, behind the numbers, the actual number of multifamily housing starts, meaning rentals, that number is way up. The single family home starts not so high. Nope. Again, why are rentals up and and, uh, single family homes not? It's because the cost Mm -hmm. and the people can't afford them. We have a shrinking middle class. But again, you make an excellent point about with interest rates going up, how are they going to how are they going to pay more interest on a huge debt already and who's going to pay for it? So what we're looking at is the bubble just keeps blowing up bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, at some point you can't blow it up any further or it simply pops, right? That's right. So, and what I wanted to know for a long time is how much longer can the party go on here? Because 
at some point, uh, the party always ends, and the people who don't know that it's ended are the ones that really get burned worse, right? Well, yeah. But again, I would have thought the party would have ended in 2012. And that was my forecast. Yeah. But I didn't know, uh, they didn't teach me in Economics 101 or graduate school about a thing called quantitative yeah, easing. Me neither. <laughs> and zero in negative interest rate policy. Yeah, I never heard of any so, of that either. You didn't, they didn't tell you that, did they? No, where did that come from? That's like a new chapter. Yeah. Like my book exactly. wasn't complete. And I that's think. why you don't know when it's going to bust because the Ponzi's keep making up new Ponzi schemes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. you like, neither of us, I thought I did pretty well in economics. I was almost going to, uh, to major in it, except all the economics professors in my school at Pace University were all communists. Uh, but I kind of wanted to do it. And, you know, like, man, none of this was in the books here. I mean, there was a lot that was in the book, but None of this. So nothing uh, prepared anyone for this. But at some point, even QE runs out, right? But again, they'll make something else up. You think? That's what I'm trying to say. They'll make up anything to keep the Ponzi scheme going. And that's another thing about Trump's tax plan. Mm -hmm. What did it do? He's allowing the big companies to repatriate the dough they got hidden overseas. Where's the money going to go into? Look at earnings. They're very good. You have S&P 500 earnings up 15% over the last year and expected to go up 19% this year. Where's that money going to go? Go back to when George Bush brought it back in 2004. You know where it went? 96% of it into stock buybacks. Yeah. You're already looking at stock buybacks now at this point of the year at a near historic high because also the tax breaks that he's given to the corporations. They, what are they going to do with the money? Yeah. They're already saying it. Cisco said it. Others are saying it. It's going back into stock buybacks. Mm -hmm. So that's juicing the market up. They're not putting it into capital expenditures. They haven't been doing it. They've been, again, earnings have been solid. But all they're doing is enriching themselves and enriching the market, which is a disconnect from the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree. We saw the Dow, you know, peak out over 27,000. Now it's it's captured most recaptured most of its losses, but it doesn't seem to want to get back to that 27,000 range again. If it doesn't do that, we're looking at the end of the rally, you think? No, um again, the rally we we say the rally is over. It could go over that. Mm. But the rally is over. Mm -hmm. It's it's peaked as we as we believe anyway, you know, that's just our forecast. And the downside risk is much greater than an upside move. If you really want to see the direction the markets are going to go in, watch gold prices. Because if the markets are in trouble, you're going to see gold prices spike. But again, go back to the beginning of February when the market started really going down. Gold prices were going down with it. Mm -hmm. They should have been going in the opposite direction. So that was our signal that this was in a crash because gold is the ultimate safe haven asset and it didn't respond proportionally. Again, it, it followed the markets down, which was contrary to where it should have gone. Mm -hmm. So that, that to us is really a key indicator to watch. The other thing we're saying, you know, right now we're seeing the cryptocurrency market struggling a bit. They can't seem to move further. When you see this market really crash, we're forecasting the crypto world is going to explode higher as well as gold prices. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that, that's what we see happening on, on, on that front. So people are going to perceive cryptos as a safe haven for capital? Well, yes, because what they're looking at, you're going to start seeing what's going to happen if the markets start crashing. You know, those things we were talking about raising interest rates that brought them down on Tuesday. Now they'll be lowering your interest rates. They'll yeah. do anything they can to keep. So the lower the interest rates go, that means the more money and the, and the more money that they dump in through quantitative easing. People are going into the cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin, as a populist coin. 
It's a hedge against the fiat currencies that you could print infinitum. With a with a crypt with a Bitcoin, for example, they say you only could print twenty one million of them. Right. With dollars, yen, euro, yuan, and pounds, you could print all you want. The sky's the limit. It so that's why we see that going up, and also gold. And here's our forecast for gold, by the way. Hmm. Right now, you know, gold has been struggling. You know, in the mid 1300s range, it can't go up, it can't go down. Now it's it's breaking down now about 1320. And it's, you know, it, it still hasn't gone below the 1300 mark in a while. But it can't break above what our breakout point is, is 1385. Mm. When it breaks over 1385, the next level we're looking for is 1450, 1470, in that over 1450. Mm -hmm. When it breaks over 1450 strongly, like 1450, 1480, 1440, 1490, you know, that, that kind of range kind of thing, we're gonna see it take a Bitcoin bounce. We believe gold will spike to over $2,000. Really? An ounce. When it, yes, when it breaks steadily, and sharply over $1,450 an ounce. But for it to get there, it has to break our 1385 number, which it has not been able to do. Yeah, it hasn't even broken 1365, which is earlier technical support of it. So, but it hasn't broken down either. Maybe it'll go right. below, below 1300 again, but probably not stay there for long. That'll be the last fake and the last chance from when it starts going up. But well, yes, because what you're also looking at is just look at the numbers that just came out in the last few days. Sales in China are way up mm. and and uh, the uh, Russian government's buying up more and more of it. Right. So th there's a lot there's a lot of demand for it. And they're also forecasting, although it's slumping a bit now because of new tax programs and and other elements that have been put in place in India, in which big gold buyers as, as the, the, the general population, that while it's down now a bit, they expect that to escalate as well. So demand will be there. And again, when you look at the equity markets, just very few people of the total population are really playing them. Where gold, when you go to countries like China and India, oh, yeah. you know, it's the national anthem. Yeah. Well, you know, China invented paper money and they've invented inflation. So it's only right that they have that institutional memory where they really, you know, understand what can happen to fiat currency. So so you think so 1385 is kind of the uh, golden la uh, golden line in the sand, if you will. And from there, who knows where it goes? because there's a limit to where it stops. Yes, 1385 is our gold, golden line in the sand. <laughs> and again, when it breaks over that and, and goes to over 1450, you know, after it stabilizes at 1450, we see again a Bitcoin bounce. And our downside risk, by the way, of gold is at, at most $100. And that's really no downside at all considering what the market is and where it's going. And again, what global consumption looks like. Yeah. And outside the U.S. and Europe, it's been going gangbusters for years already. For, for over a decade, China and Russia have been buying both central banks and individuals in China. And India was big. But like you said before, they implemented these ridiculous controls to try to stop people from from fleeing their currency, the rupee, I guess. And of course, it's failed and people will be heading back to gold very shortly in India if they haven't already. It's just traditional. So these are the trends for for the current year, basically markets down, interest rates up, housing down, and precious metals up. I guess that pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? Yes. Again, the the the, the what to watch is gold because if if they raise interest rates and the dollar becomes stronger, gold prices are going to go lower. I mean, they run in opposite directions. 
The higher the interest rates are, the lower gold prices go because there's an opportunity cost in holding gold and it pays no interest. Right. So that'll be that'll be bearish on the market. But again, minus, you know, really radical uh, interest rate hikes, we don't see gold going much lower. And also, you hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, this inflation cycle is good for gold. Hmm. You know, not this inflation cycle. <laughs> you got to see inflation at, you know, six, seven percent, five, six, seven percent, you know, before it really starts to kick in as a heavy hit. But right now, you know, two, two and a half percent inflation, you know, gold isn't going to, as we see it, be that hedge. It has Inflation has to go much higher. Agreed. I totally am with you on that. Well, find Gerald's work at trendsjournal.com and uh, hey, We'll always have a link to it in the show notes of the interview. Check us out, Financial Survival Network. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, or use the Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, or check out the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Gerald, we got any uh, events coming up in the near future, I hope? No, no, none, none coming up. Uh, well, hey, maybe, maybe it's getting close to time uh, to do another one, you know? <laughs> I'm not too sure. <laughs> they're a lot of work. I know, I know. Yeah. Believe me, I've done them. They're a lot of work, but uh, sometimes they can be extremely helpful. Anyway, Gerald, wish you the best. We'll talk to you again soon. Oh, thanks for having me on, and thank you for all that you do in alerting people how to uh, prepare for what's coming ahead. And likewise. Thanks, Gerald. Bye-bye now. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Mortgage. Now we're looking at rates. If it just goes back to its traditional five, five and a half, six percent, just say five to six percent, and the markets are bowing over at that point, What's going to happen if it hits six or seven? And what happens to U.S. debt? Well, the U.S. debt. And how about the global debt? Mm. You have a global debt of over forty seven trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the U.S. debt is with what? It's exceeding 20 trillion. And it's now the highest it's been in 70 years. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at in, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio. So. What we're looking at is a world that cannot tolerate higher interest rates because it's very simple. The party is ending. More debt, rising interest rates, higher costs, greater burden. And then when you look at the United States, and let's go back to the beginning of February, uh, Kerry, when the market started to unravel, you know the reason they gave. Well, wages are going up and we're afraid about inflation. Remember that one? Sure. Well, hourly rage, wages, according to the reports, went up nearly 3%. And that was the strongest increase since June of 2009. But when we look behind the headlines, we saw the facts. And the facts were that the increase largely affected supervisory positions and that wages for non-supervisory jobs, which comprise 80% of the labor force, remained at a miserly 2.4% growth rate. Mm -hmm. So it's not filtering its way down to the real middle class, but... FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is 228.18, last day of the month. And, well, what a month it's been, but we're, we're watching the trends here, and we'll be talking more about that later. As always, of course, email us to be part of the show, kl at kerrylutz.com. So interest rates are on the rise. Can the stock market withstand it? 
Can housing sales withstand it? Can the economy at large withstand higher interest rates, especially with deficits running at a trillion dollars per annum and higher? Well, Gerald Salenti, you run Trends Journal, and you're the one to ask. So welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me on, Carrie. Always great being on with you. Uh, always great to have you too there, Gerald. And hey, if you want to find Gerald's site, trendsresearch.com, highly recommended. It's kind of like getting almost like getting a peek at tomorrow's newspaper or perhaps next month's. So, hey, higher interest rates, they're kind of inevitable, especially with the deficits we're running, everything else. Can the Fed avoid seeing higher rates? Certainly on the short term, maybe they control it. Long term, 5% interest uh, on 30-year fixed mortgages it's just around the corner. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's taking its toll already. And um, you go back and look at what happened with uh, new home sales. They fell 7.8% in December when rates rose to... The middle class did get a tax cut, which should add something to their bottom line. Ah, peanuts. Ah. Well, peanuts are better than crumbs, though, aren't they, Gerald? Yeah, not, not a lot better. <laughs> uh, not considering the tax breaks that the wealthy got. And again... You look at the tax policy institutes and centers, the nonpartisan groups, they, according to them, 80% of the tax breaks will benefit the 1% the most. Mm. And, the, and the tax breaks will be running out for we the little people in several years besides. And so this was just, again, the, I'm not, I'm just giving you the, what I've sure. read and what has been accepted as generally accepted as the truth from the analysis being done. So going back to the housing market, here's the other big phony lie that they're putting out. Uh, maybe not a lie, but a misconception. You keep hearing that, well, you know, the reason why the uh, housing market is slumping is there's not enough inventory out there, mm. right? Yeah, I heard that a lot. Yeah. Well, currently, it, it will take 6.1 months to clear the housing supply. Mm. The normal standard is six to seven months right. to clear inventory. So it's right at the average. Mm -hmm. It's not at the low end. But that's being ignored by the media. And what they're basically ignoring is why housing sales are going down is that going back to jobs. Wages stink for the average American. And we're talking about, again, with interest rates going up. So with disposable income increasing just under 2% and a rate rise to 4 or 5% for a 30-year loan, it spikes monthly mortgage costs 12% for the average American that's being frozen out of the market. So that's what's really going on. You just don't have people with money to buy homes and homes are too expensive. And then they say things like, well, there's a shortage of inventory for homes under $100,000. Now, where are you living? What, are you kidding me? <laughs> Home for under $100,000? You're talking a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. In, uh, in most areas in the country, 100 k is not going to buy you much. Although during the crash, 100000 could buy you a heck of a nice house in a lot of places in the country, but all the, the prices seem to be at record levels again. And let's not forget when they say these housing starts, they don't really break out for public consumption. Again, behind the numbers, the actual number of multifamily housing starts, meaning rentals, that number is way up. The single family home starts not so high. Nope. Again, why are rentals up and, and uh, single family homes not. It's because it, the cost mm -hmm. and the people can't afford them. We have a shrinking middle class. But again, you make an excellent point about with interest rates going up, how are they going to, how are they going to pay more interest on a huge debt already? And who's going to pay for it? So what we're looking at is the bubble just keeps blowing up bigger and bigger. Mm, yeah. Well, at some point you can't blow it up any further or it 
simply pops, right? That's right. So, and what I wanted to know for a long time is how much longer can the party go on here? Because 4.40% mortgage and pending home sales dropped 4.7% in January, hitting the lowest point in four years. Mm -hmm. So go back four years ago. Yeah, everything wasn't great, you know, and, and, we're just starting to get into the recovery of, of the housing market. So what we're looking at, and you're seeing what happens every time you heard the new Fed Chair Powell come out at the House hearing on uh, Tuesday saying that they were a bit hawkish. That was his inclination without saying those words to raise rates more than Wall Street has anticipated and bam, the market drops 299 points. So it's apparent that the United States and the world uh, cannot take higher interest rates. And that's really what's kept the whole Ponzi scheme going is the flood of cheap money and historically low interest rates. So what's gonna happen? Well, we believe this is the end of the Trump rally. Uh, and there's going to be, at least a 10% correction, and that's how already happened, but it went back up, and possibly even a bear market if um, some geopolitical issues start to explode in the Middle East or other kind of a um, black swan event or, or a uh, wild card that could really drive the markets lower. And so, so it's not the time to be buying a house. I mean... Look, Gerald, we had interest rates on the 30 year fixed. They were at one point, uh, if you remember way back when, I mean, maybe even eight, nine years ago, they went down to 2.75% on a 30 year fix 